Good morning. Hello. Is that Good. you? Are you there? Hello, yes. everyone. They're all there. <laughs> They're all watching now. Look, I can see them. Many still in their pajamas. Um, how are you, Josie? You're still in your pajamas, aren't you? I am. Well, there's a very blurry line between pajamas and daywear these days. Isn't these days, <laughs> isn't, there? isn't everything a pajama if you wear it to sleep in? Um, I'm wearing my top that says Babes for Bernie uh, that I bought in 2016 in a real feat of enthusiasm. Uh, it's, you know, and I remember when I bought it thinking, this is either going to be really cool one day or a really sad reminder. And who knew that I would get to have that feeling twice? So lucky me. Um, uh, See, that's what Hilton that's what... finds in the, uh, in the remake version of Planet of the Apes. He doesn't <laughs> find the Statue of Liberty. He just finds a Babes for Bernie t-shirt there washed up on the beach um i'll be doing maths uh, maths uh, lesson today I, I enjoy this bit of actually the homeschooling thing of going i never knew how much i'd forgotten or never knew in the world of mathematics it's a lot wow. of fun what 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 um is it that thing that i a lot of people find which is when their child is still relatively young the maths homework suddenly becomes too hard for them as an adult no i'm i'm finding it very yeah it just it's i'll tell you what it says that bit which it takes a few more minutes for you to then go oh yeah i don't normally use four open brackets a minus x over three equals y a i don't normally have to then change that to be x as the subject so just those kind of little things um so i was so uh, fun it is. I'm enjoying it. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. I'm, I'm really enjoy, enjoying those things. And uh, I was just going to say, the uh, we we got show and tell today. We have, uh, for those of you who don't know who we've got on today, uh, we have Adam Kay, we have Dean Burnett, and we have Grace Petrie. Uh, tomorrow we have Kerry pritchett McLean, John Hegley, and who else, Josie? We've got one other guest as well. Um, I... I, oh, Katie oh, Brand. Katie Brand. Katie Brand. And uh, Thursday is, uh, I have to admit, I know you shouldn't have favourites, but I'm so glad that we have Reese Shearsmith on because Inside <gasps> Number Nine really is my favourite TV show and it's, I love it. And he is how, a great to talk to. How so is, consistently wonderful. Series upon series upon series. It just blows my mind. Like the last series, we were talking about this episode um, uh, that's a very gentle family drama with the mm. kind of secrets behind it loves loves oh, great adventure yes. uh, named after the ultravox song yeah absolutely wonderful i just oh i loved it so much i can't wait um good well everyone seems very chipper i'm feeling very chipper i went for a walk on my bad ankle yesterday <laughs> so everything's good for me i'll be running within a month <laughs> The, the, the thing, the that, thing I found, that I found most impressive in terms of the challenges of this is uh, I don't like to compare myself to Jesus. Not that often, you know, but You'd my ability. That other people did it. Of course. And uh, the um, but every day on Twitter, there is for a long part of the day, the lead trend is a journalist that I know that if I press on Peter Hitchens or Rod Little or Alison Pearson, there is no joy. And like Jesus during the Lent period in the desert, I have managed not to press on any of those once. So I have no idea about their hot take on isolation and their new knowledge that they have uh, about disease, which they've all managed to read up with very quickly on their Wikipedia pages. You so can just guess, like can't Jesus. you? You are. You should be very you... proud of yourself. Like Jesus was. <laughs> the one thing they always say about him. He was ever so pleased with himself. That's all they say. No. Um, um, so, show and tell. So, show and tell today. I've got a. Uh, my show and tell is. Got, I'm warning you, it's, it is. It's something quite, quite sad and beautiful. But uh, as many of you will have seen, Michael Rosen uh, has not been well. Uh, it appears that he was in intensive care, but hopefully now, uh, from what I've read, he's now in, in a ward. So with luck, he's, he's on the way to recovery. Michael Rosen, of course, writes beautiful books and does wonderful things, his children events. And uh, I went to an exhibition at the House of Illustration of Quentin Blake's work. And there was one room which was just one book. And it was this book here, Michael Rosen's sad book. Oh, wow. 
and yeah. it is such a beautiful book. And and I'm interested. I've, the reason I chose this one out of all Michael Rosen is because a lot of people don't seem to to know that much uh, about it. There's Quentin Blake is always again the humanity in all of his drawings are and, and just mm -hmm. so prolific still. And yeah. the, I'm just going to read the opening because uh, this is uh, there's the, the the first picture there of Michael Rosen. Um, this is me being sad. Maybe you think I'm being happy in this picture. Really, I'm being sad, but pretending I'm being happy. I'm doing that because I think people won't like me if I look sad. Sometimes sad is very big. It's everywhere, all over me. Then I look like this, and there's nothing that I can do about it. What makes me most sad is when I think about my son, Eddie. He died. I loved him very, very much, but he died anyway. And I think that the the beauty in that line, the simplicity in that line, I loved him very very much but and it's just such a beautiful book and or you know and so i just wanted it just to make sets that me off every time because it's really it's so, so no, don't be so, now because it is it's such a beautiful and important book about also about sadness and about not being fit i'm not about not always putting on a face and yeah. uh so I apologise for starting with something that was that is, it, but it's just an incredible work of beauty, and uh, we wish uh, Michael Rosen uh, a, a a rapid recovery. Sorry, be... Joe. I just I found it last night, and I was reading it again, and I thought I just want so many no, people it's... to see that book. No, I think it's really important, and I think it's also really like it's really great how beloved he is. Like just seeing everyone be like, oh no, no, not not you, thanks. We all love you. <laughs> Um, I, I'm really, really glad now that my show and tell isn't like, here's some pasta in the shape of penises. <laughs> 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 um, what I've got for you is something which I am 100% sure that I used on a previous uh, podcast with you about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Let's be real. Oh, um, I love nostalgia boom. This is good. I like this. Is, I'm going to get a Proustian rush. So this is a gift that was given to me when I was 16 years old, by my boyfriend at the time. No, at the time, what as if people are like, are you, are you still together now? <laughs> um, and it says on it, condensed inspiration. And the reason it's not spelled correctly is because he had very, very um, intense dyslexia. So he sort of really, really put in massive, massive effort to like work out all the spellings and to write it and, it's got a thing at the back that it doesn't even really work anywhere. It says, ideal for dinner parties. Warning, this product may cause baldness. And then on the size, it says, recommended retail price, £15,000. And <laughs> what it used to be, I haven't opened it for about 10 years. I won't open it, actually. It used to be rhubarb and custard sweets. This is what happens to rhubarb and custard sweets if you keep them for 22 <laughs> years. But, um, yeah, it was... The the first time I think anyone has really done anything like this for me in my life. And like, I remember it was because I was like, oh, I want to be writing some stand up, but I haven't got any inspiration because I'm 16. I've got nothing to say. Um, nothing's happened to me. <laughs> um, so he gave me this. And um, yeah, I've always, always kept it, even though oh. I have strong suspicions from his Twitter accounts that he's got some very saucy views about politics so um, <laughs> yeah. isn't that cool oh, I, I, I can't wait to see that on celebrity antiques road trip i don't know what that's <laughs> going to go for but I've, they um, told four pound fifty <laughs> so we are joined today our, 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 hey, first, our, guest. our, our first guest is uh is adam k who's uh former doctor best-selling author it's lovely to have you hello adam morning. Good morning. Oh, hi. Thanks, for thanks for having me how are you we should ask we should ask everyone this this at the moment i yes, i i am I'm, I'm very well i'm yet to be yet to be coroned unless i'm one of the 17 percent of people who is asymptomatic in which case it's fine so that is so in terms of so about, so about that's the number of people that that's what we currently know in terms of people who will not be showing uh, because it's, of course I mean, it's, 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 it's difficult and I think uh, it will only really be known in the sort of the, the final tally when we're out the other side of this. But there's, if you remember the Diamond Princess cruise um, where um, where they couldn't they couldn't get off. And so um, they, they just basically audited this relatively small number of people uh, and and they and they tested everyone, 
And from that, they found out that 17% of that lot who didn't think they'd had any illness whatsoever swabbed positive uh, for this particular coronavirus. So, but who knows? Can I ask, okay, so when they swabbed all the people from the crews, were there still people amongst that population of the crews that didn't get it at all? Yes, many. Wow. So, I mean, it... You know, they, they talk about this R naught thing, which is the number of people that each individual with it passes it onto, which is probably somewhere between two or three, but that will vary between different countries because, like in Italy, lots of there's lots of uh, multi generations living in the same house, and that makes it easy. But um, I was speaking to a, a virologist who's uh, who reckoned that around you've got a 30 percent chance of giving it to someone in the same house as you so it's not like you know it's not a plague that goes you know everywhere um but we should we shall see i think we're in the at the foothills of learning about what this uh, what this uh, virus is all about yeah i think that is one of the biggest uh like for, for people who people who are worrying and trying to work out is if there is such a, a a worry of giving it to other people almost rather than getting it that that moment that especially with with the elderly especially you know that i think a lot of people at the moment who are not seeing members of their family are going i feel all right but i just cannot you know and, and to know when it, it is possible to do that. I know there's a lot of people who, you know, have it's what I'm seeing this week in particular. I've noticed an increased number of people saying I've suddenly noticed how much I miss my brother, my sister, my mm-hmm. cousin, my mum, whatever it might be in terms of and still going. But I feel fine. But no. Absolutely. And that is still the right attitude, isn't it? Abs- absolutely. Look, you know, the you know, looking at us here, we'll probably be fine if we get it or we were fine when we did get it. But you know, we all have people in our lives who are much less likely to be fine by dint of their age or the fact they've got, they do have, I mean, there's this, I found it very distressing, the idea that, uh, you know, another ex people have died, but don't worry, they all had underlying health conditions all mm. were old, as if they're less important. Like, we've all got friends who've been undergoing cancer treatment or they've had heart conditions or there are uncle who's 82 they're you know also from the most basic perspective when i'm 85 i don't want people looking at me going well you are 85 you know (laughs) that's not what we want for a society like of course it isn't it's it's ridiculous you know and i read that there was a really beautiful collection of obituaries in the guardian that basically the headline was something like so much more life to live and that's what it is isn't it everyone has more life to live and more to give no matter where they are yeah. Well, that's what I've, I find it. I found, I find it, it. I found it interesting to see the sudden turn in people who, not that long ago, were saying, "You have to remember the people who fought in the war, the old people, the you know, and all that." That using it then as their alibi for their particular kind of manifesto, and now they're saying, "Well, the old pit, they've had a good life." And it, hang on a minute, a moment ago we were meant to be treasuring these people and respecting them, and, and uh, yeah, I think that has been just before we started. We were saying that I, I have found that the most disturbing thing, which is people's attitude towards, and also. Uh, to, at least two of the people I know who have who have died uh, in the last week had, n- as far as we know, no underlying health conditions. One person was twenty five. One person was in their in their forties. They they appeared to be perfectly healthy. There was no reason for them to know or to have any suspicion that if they got it. So, so I think you know we should uh, not lose our, our our respect for well humanity. I suppose that's it's kind of just one of those things. <laughs> yeah. like, like kind of you know humanity. Um, you must find you've had a lot of uh, b- because of. Of, of your book and because you were a doctor do you find yourself being asked to do a lot of different things and having to sometimes say i'm not sure i'm the right person for this because i'm not still practicing or, or are you keeping have you always trying to still kept up with uh, the information that's out there in terms yeah, of uh, I'm, i have, I have uh, I've, I've not uh, practiced medicine for 10 years um i worked as an obstetrician when i was a doctor and i've been constantly drunk in the intervening decade. So <laughs> if anyone wants to ask me a question, it's a very particular roll of the dice uh, that you know, they're, they're, they're embarking upon. Um, but um, I, the, you know, my interest in science and medicine and the body has never gone away. So I do, I do sort of, I do read as much as I, as much as I can, but I am definitely not an expert. 
Do you have you got advice for people of, people of, where, of where the best places are to look? Because again, the, with social media, with all these things, there's so mm. much information going out there. Would you say there are certain starting points where people go, go there, check these sites. These are where you'll yeah. get the best. Information. So I find that if you get a message on WhatsApp, on WhatsApp about someone's uncle who used to work at Stanford, that's generally pretty spot on, and you should probably <laughs> share that around. Add in a bit if you think there's anything extra they've missed out, maybe about sipping hot water. So that. That's general what I advise. I got sent a, um, um, a joke by about four different WhatsApp groups that I tried then to retell Johnny and I retold it so badly. It was like it had been additionally sent to a further WhatsApp group of even more digitally, <laughs> un- <laughs> which I, I would love to tell you all because I'm sure you've all already heard it, which goes, so there's a plane and in the plane is um, Donald Trump um, the Pope, uh, Boris Johnson, Nicola Sturgeon, and a little schoolboy. Of course, very normal. <laughs> Get taken a plane together. Oh no, guys, the plane is going down. And they check, and there's only four um, uh, parachutes. Parachute. You can see why I'm telling <laughs> this works. Right. There's only four parachutes. Right, the Pope says, guys, I, I've got to have one. I'm the representative of God on earth. And he grabs one and goes. Already, I'm like, would the Pope do that? He I feel like he wouldn't. Okay. So then Donald Trump gets what he says. Sam, right, I'm getting it. I'm the best one here. Bye. Boris Johnson grabs one and he says, I need it. I'm the smartest man in England. <laughs> Again, very weird that he would say that, but it does. And it also, in keeping with his behaviour, that he would. So we don't feel the slightest bit shocked by that. Then... There's one more parachute and Nicola Sturgeon turns to the little boy and says, listen, I don't think it's fair for me to take the parachute over you. You've got your whole life ahead of you. And the little boy says, don't worry. The smartest man in England only took my satchel. There's two parachutes. (laughs) (laughs) So I'd like to thank every WhatsApp group for sending me that. It's been a joy every single time. (laughs) I don't hear you do proper joke joke, jokes enough. You do more (laughs) of that kind of thing in your your set. Like I said, I always want you to do more jokes which end with you moving your glasses and going, I don't know, but the Pope says chauffeur. Anyway, uh, Adam... Sorry, go on, Josie. Oh, no, I was going to say, we've had a lot of questions for you. Um, but um, we must, to, we must to get Adam show and tell first before we do oh, that. sorry. Yes, I'd All like right. it. Uh, so I put so something very, uh, very personal to me. Um, it's my uh, L5S1 uh, spinal disc. I don't know if that's... Uh, you can see that, uh, see that clearly there? Whoa. Um, Whoa. So that, that used to uh, live between my, my lumbar and sacral spines. And then um, one day my right leg stopped working and I remembered from my medical training that wasn't meant to happen. And uh, I, I, went, uh, I went to the doctor who said, oh, yeah, one of your discs has gone nuts. We're going to take it out. And um, I said, can I keep it? And they said, no. I was like, well, it's mine. And then they couldn't argue with that. And uh, so it's been, yeah, it's been sitting in my office ever since. And have you ever taken what? it out and given it a little pr- No, I'm, I'm worried. I, 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 don't, I don't know if I'm going to need it in the future or anything, but I've <laughs> sort of, I've, I've kept it in its presumably formalin or something uh, to keep, isn't keep that the, it nice. That's the kind of thing that gets also used in voodoo dolls. Someone steals that and places it in a wax effigy. You then might be able to be controlled by other individuals. Oh no! Oh, that's hadn't thought of that. But then again, maybe I can clone myself using it. Oh yeah, that's true. So, that's a, I mean, it's a gamble. Way. I think so. I think, I think so. What are the rules. the rules on what if you've had something cut out of you or off you? What are the rules on what you are allowed to say to the medical people? I would like to take that home in a jar and what must be incinerated? Because when my son was born, I thought it'd be nice to keep the kind of his umbilical cord all wrapped up in a kind of, you know, little bit of, yeah. uh, you know, and uh, to which my wife went, that's disgusting and strange. I went, well, you never know. He might want to see it. And uh, anyway, eventually he didn't and we threw it away. But what are the general rules on what can what be taken? Can be t- I don't, I don't really know. I mean, any potentially hazardous biological uh, waste. Uh, so, f- for example, if it could be infectious, I mean, you don't want to be spreading, you know, Ebola or TB or anything around just because you've taken something 
home that's like the start of an episode of casualty or something isn't it <laughs> <laughs> insisting that they take their 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 their, their ebola swab home with them um but i don't know uh i don't know like if you had a like an amputation i, I don't know what the, what the what the rule would be wow Oh, oh that's, a ch- that's a challenge anyway for later life, hopefully. Yeah. Um, oh, well, Dean's coming on. So he's a scientist and he's got the advantage of about 20 minutes to Google it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Josie, sorry, you had some questions. Oh, yeah, yeah. We've had a lot of different people um, writing to ask you lots of different questions. Um, <laughs> so this, I'm going to ask this because I saw on Twitter that a a very specific medical fetish website had donated all of its equipment to the government and then made quite an like quite a kind of good statement afterwards saying like it obviously shouldn't be on us doing this and we're very disappointed and so somebody said somebody called grow eat gift which we don't know if that's some particular fetish site or something but they've said um oh, is there any fetish fetish wear that could be used as ppe is there it's, is it, uh, oh, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I mean um, there either is or there isn't a shortage of PPE. There is a shortage of PPE if you ask any single person who works for the NHS at the moment. And there isn't if you're the government who says, you know, we've just transferred another, you know, 485 trillion masks. I don't know where they're sending them. What? And so, but if we believe the doctors and the nurses who are saying, you know, we're, we're, we don't have good enough or enough stuff, um, there, there's a shortage. And um, it hasn't just been the fetish community who've, uh, who've <laughs> mucked in. Um, I've seen, um, yesterday I saw uh, on my Facebook, a school's design technology department had been 3D printing and sort of, and then assembling sort of, sort of masks with sort of uh, the sort of perspex uh, things. And schools have been donating like goggles and sort of snorkel masks and like you know, random science labs have been sending in their um, their, their their sort of eye masks for you know the, the sort of boffin eye masks. I presume Lee Dean will have the correct term for for those. You know, when you're holding a fizzing test tube, that that one. Um, um, and that was that's been really really lovely. And it's that's extended to the fetish community who have. Uh, I mean, so I'm not, hopefully the ones they sent were like the scrubs that are made of scrubs not the ones that are made of sort of shiny latex but you know any port in a storm i imagine you know if if you don't have any any clean protective gear it doesn't really matter what you look like so yeah Kind of it is kindness, though, isn't it? If the if the if the doctor or nurse is leaning over you and and they're, they're wearing a leather mask that has all studs coming out of it, they look somewhat like a kind of Clive Barker image. It kind yeah, of livens that, up the entire process. You, yeah, you don't want yeah, to you don't round. want to come round uh, from your intubation uh, <laughs> care unit and he's wearing a ball gag. That will. Um, <laughs> are we allowed well, to say ball gag at ten thirty? We, we are now, and, and I should say that, that you say you there, don't, there may well be some people who would also like to come around to that. So it's, it's you know. That's true, yeah. It's a little Absolutely. bit of everything. Um, we pays get, we'll to be come equivocal. Back, we'll come back with some questions uh, in, in a moment. We'll come back with Dean Burnett as well. Uh, but first, we're going to go over live to, oh, man, her wallpaper is looking fantastic, like in a Paul McGuigan film who did the, uh, uh, directed a lot of episodes of Sherlock and Gangster Number One and, and a brilliant film, Film Stars Don't Die in Liverpool, uh, which is yeah, really, fa- I really highly recommend with that. But, and Paul McGuigan does, has the best wallpaper in any movies and she has the best wallpaper today. We're going to Lester and Grace Petrie. And Grace Petrie. Hello, good morning. Hello. Are you to sing now? Sorry? Are you wanting me to sing now? <laughs> well, would you like to? Only if you the like. The great story. I thought I was doing it at the end. Sorry, I need right. to. Do you want to do? Do you want to do a show and tell instead, and then we'll come back okay. and you can do some singing. Yeah, don't mess with the routine. With the routine, Robin. Grace, it's not yeah. listen, right now. <laughs> Grace, if you're feeling too nervous to sing one of your, don't worry. <laughs> I believe, and I actually really enjoy them. So <laughs> even if everyone out there is. <laughs> um, so what I have, so what I have today is, um, uh, so I have a song called Black Tie, um, which I, if you were watching Stay at Home Festival the other day when I was on, I think I sang it, um, and it's sort of my most kind of 
personal song, a very personal song to me. And um, there is somebody who, I hate using the word fan, uh, it sounds tremendously arrogant, but there's somebody who comes to a lot of shows who is really, 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 really cool, who is an incredible uh, glass artist. And uh, she came to my show in Winchester and gave me this. That she... oh. I, know I know who that is. I think yeah. that I, I think, think I've got. Is... I don't know which drawer I've got it in because I think she made me a Robin as well. If it's the same person, I'm thinking you, of. I'm I, thinking can of. I can do better. Robin is classic. Come on, what no, are no, you? No, no, no. That that's great. <laughs> Realise who it is. I, th I think it is the person. I, uh, uh, the the same. Oh, guys. But what guys, a great gonna... thing if it turns out that there's more than one glass. That we have a lot of different glass artists. <laughs> that's our core question. demographic. Guys, guys, guys. Of... She told me that she's a big fan of yours. Sorry, fan of yours. Sorry, Jesse. Guys, I haven't got one because she obviously doesn't like my stuff. <laughs> no, I think it's because you, <laughs> you, 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 you that, play for big it, venue. Here that says I I hate Josie Long's comedy. Oh. Oh. That would sell it very well. She should put it on the market. But I <laughs> <laughs> I I keep that in my um, front window, um, oh. and uh, it's uh, it's something that's very very special to me. And I'm just going to try and I'm going to try and say it. she's on Instagram, and you should check out her glass art because it's absolutely amazing. And um, the company name I'm not going to be able to pronounce this. I think is uh, is it Illyram I double L Y R A. Nth Illyrian. Um, we'll put that up afterwards, so to, we'll, we'll make sure that we, that we do that. Because I am an idiot, but um, I love that, and I think it's really, really beautiful. And um, uh, you should all check out her glass art; it's amazing. Just so that and if anyone I is watching this, is is going to be on Jules Holland's later program in in the next few months. Please, when Jules Holland throws to you, just go. Oh, you want me to sing now? Well, I have to go and get my guitar. <laughs> Oh right, okay. Oh, okay. I hadn't realised that. So that that is that's a it's a lovely. <laughs> Shall I get a guitar? Do you want it? Do you want a song now? Do I get a guitar? Are you doing one of your, your jokes, Robin, or not? Because no, I no, can no, get I it. Lovely yeah. idea. Yeah. One of, in, on top of the pops, every music show, people just went, "What? Well, I haven't got my harmonica. I thought we were doing a oh this uh, David Diddy Hamilton. I thought we were doing a little bit of a chat." <laughs> oh, about some things I've got in my... Oh, ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, we'll come back to you later on for, for a song or whatever you want to do. It's your... It's, it's just nice to see you. Freedom. Nice to see you. I think today today's the day we really relaxed into our groove, into isn't, our it, groove Robin? isn't it, Robin? Yeah, I, I, I can see the viewing, you know, the viewing figures. <laughs> can we even call them, you know, whatever they are. I think people go, no, 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 no. It started with a level, actually it never started with professionalism. That's one of the things I think has marked out our career is a failure to learn. <laughs> and listen, it's too late to learn now. Great, I'll see you later on. You don't have to have your guitar. You do whatever you want. See you shortly. Um, uh, I would my house. All my guitars <laughs> in my house. There we are. I, yeah, I would singing. like CC. I would like to say I would like to say at this juncture that we do have a tip cup if you're enjoying the show. <laughs> um the reason we're doing it is because um is because uh, basically our industry closed and there's so many people who have spent their lives sort of taking I would say something of a risk in trying to be freelance with their lives and to make art and and sort of uh, living a kind of high wire life uh, and then suddenly to um, have everything closed has been very difficult and frightening for everyone but it's not just that we are also trying to support um, our industry as a whole and um, perfect time to burp we're hoping to um, share out um if we do make any money to share it out to smaller venues as well because there are all these very small uh, art centers and theaters and community centers around the country that basically exist by force of will and by love and well you know sort of treading a fine line before this happened and so we really want to do what we can to support them because I think as well in times like this people might think that the arts is like a little kind of icing on the top of life and that it's a luxury or something but actually it's part of what is integral to kind of making society happy and keeping us going and and letting us all kind of work out what we're doing and understand it better so I think it's very very important for us to try and do this um so there you go. That's my pitch. Now, are we throwing back 
to Adam. Oh, we we're going to join Adam, and we also got. We now have uh, Dean Burnett is going to join us as well. Hello, Dean. Good morning. Oh, oh no. or merely a, a frozen oh, image oh, of oh. Dean Burnett. Possibly he's he's been waiting for. He, he's he's had enough now, and he's actually left a card out of himself. Uh, he's not going to get involved he's, at all. He's he's Hello, Dean, all right, uh, Skype keeps cutting out for some reason, so I'm not going to touch it ever again. And hopefully, we'll get through this. Do not fiddle with things. Your area is the brain, not other pieces, <laughs> not other of, te- pieces of technology. <laughs> Don't um, fiddle with that. Yes, that's. We'll, I'll tell you, we'll, we'll rattle through to uh, first of all. Let's go then with uh, you. Have a show and tell, don't you, uh, Dean? Yeah. People um, stuck at home a lot. I've been going through old boxes to see if there's anything I could sort out, and I realised um, a few years ago uh, there's a guy on free cycle down the road, like twenty minutes away, a retired science teacher who was uh, just getting rid of his old documents and stuff, and he had a massive collection of Understanding Science, uh, the complete volumes from the 1960s. And he was just going to throw them out. So I thought, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll go get those. And I realized I still had them. So, huh. uh, you know, it's, it's Understanding Science. It's uh, every Friday, uh, presumably. Uh, it's uh, two and six. That's how much it costs. I mean, I don't even know what currency that is, but it's still, it's, it's two and six. And I found it particularly uh, interesting lately because one of these earlier articles, there's lots of technology sections, about three or four in a row about the combustion engine, which must have been new at the time and uh, about the cathode ray tubes and things like that. Uh, but we've got Man Against Bacteria. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, oh, they're telling us about 1960s uh, bacterial and infectious research. And as I say, you know, I love how, the illustration. Yeah, but given how the current uh, understanding is, this guy is, um, he's basically got two test tubes full of uh, bacterial material, and uh, he's just got no gloves on. He's just poking it with a stick. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how reliable that is as a reflection of 1960s uh, bacterial research, but it seems like it's very uh, ironic, I think, given the current uh, understanding we have of pathogens and uh, the, in fact, the, the entire world is quite um, savvy to not spread and stuff right now. That, that 1960s medical expert is just throwing them around, just sloshing yeah. them. And it just, and it, also, I, I do love that style of old school um, illustration. And it, it's really, info- really in, in depth stuff. Like this is meant for the general public, I think. And to see it in such detail was quite it's quite cool to see how things have changed over time or how they remain exactly the same so something to think about i guess that's very much like the when, when adam was talking about you know that opening moment from casualty or the opening mm. moment from a 1970, 1970s dystopian tv series in which a <laughs> bunch you know, oh just yeah there's oh don't worry about that anyway i'm just off to hong kong and then i'm going to paris i'll be back in a minute <laughs> <laughs> or it's something like they're not for the lab and macgyver has to get them out with a coat hanger and a chewing gum or something that's one of those old school uh, plots like Oh my god, isn't that the chewing gum you've just been keeping in that bacterial solution? Yeah, don't worry about that. <laughs> anyway, I'm just off to Berlin. <laughs> um, the uh we've got some some proper questions for you. And the, okay. one of the first ones, which is you've you've wait, written wait. Robin, oh, I want to ask. Oh, I want oh, to ask. I want to ask Dean how he is first, because at the start of the show we were like, we're going to have to ask people how they are, and I want to say, how are you? Um, like I was saying before we started, uh, my um my daily life consists of sitting in this my garden office uh, on my own. So I've not been a great change since the pandemic happened. And but I will say that because it's outdoors and the sunlight's coming in, if I suddenly start looking ethereal, that's what the sun. I can't get the light any better. So it's like a god filter. I'm not, I'm not being raptured or anything, but uh, you know, it's just. Suddenly, I might just start glowing. I have a large face, and it's very reflective. So, but if you were being raptured, it would be a real. <laughs> were being raptured, it would be a real coup for us. Yeah, yeah that'd be cool. Right? <laughs> so they start rising up like. Ugh. Oh, that, that could be my chair. Actually, it does do that sometimes. It just look, just pops, and I start just lifted. So yeah, got a strong, strong uh, rapture vibes today. So otherwise, fine. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Well, we'll come back to you when during the well, solstice. We'll come back to you when during the solstice as well, because I imagine your face will look wonderful then. <laughs> just that small crack in the shed. That um, yeah. the uh, this is you, you. You've written a book, the Happy Brain, which I think was that's actually your first book, wasn't it? The Happy Brain. Second. It's, it's, oh, second book. Was it? yeah. Oh, idiot stupid brain. brain, of course. Idiot brain is the first. But the, mm. but it's interesting. A lot of people have questions, obviously, about how we're dealing with this and the effects it might have, and in particular, the effects that it might have on children. There's a few people that I've spoken to who are already saying they're, they're getting worried about the fact that maybe they're six, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, uh, uh, they're just washing their hands the whole time. Mm. And I wondered how much you know in terms of what are the best ways 
of us, th those with, with young children, of managing to both deal with this situation, but at the same time, not possibly then set up what may well be seen as, you know, maybe ob ob obsessive behaviours in, in later yeah, life. Yeah, that's a really tricky one, because obviously this is it's kind of unprecedented in terms of you know, how do people react to this in terms of family life and you know, interpersonal relationships and stuff. I think perhaps one of the more important parts would be to not to try and pretend that it's not happening. I think a lot of people are trying to instill a sense of normality or daily life or structured routine. Like the whole homeschooling thing is obviously necessary because kids need education and school is open right now. But the idea that you have to provide the exact same structure for them as you would at a school is perhaps, an, it's over the top perhaps because like everyone's still finding their feet here. And the idea that you have to maintain like an absolutely normal you know, daily life is potentially harmful, potentially misleading, because then you know, everyone has like their different different way to you know interact with the wider world and stuff. We all have our routines, but if you try and in install like a, a school routine into your home, then that sort of distorts both. In that, if a kid knows like when I go to school, this happens. At home, I'm safe because this happens, and it's it's really important to sort of preserve the sense of safety and sense of reassurance they have from their home life or from their parental relationship so i think it's important to acknowledge that it's happening like so say the kid says i'm, I'm worried well, so am i you know this is a a worrying situation to be in so perhaps form um that can be reassuring in its ways and like well it's not just me then it's uh, mum and dad think this is uh, and this isn't great either you can sort of like roll your eyes and grin and bear it but don't try and pretend that nothing's happening or that they are wrong to feel worried and stressed about this because that is you know it, it's a valid reaction this is weird this is scary all our safe you know all our mental safety uh, <clears throat> our mental routines which give us a sense of safety a sense of comfort they've all been completely thrown out of whack and that's not great i know that's and we have a little a lot fewer options to do anything about it now because of all the restrictions in place and these are all valid these are all good but they will have a more profound effect on us than most people perhaps will acknowledge. So I think it's important to acknowledge that you know, don't shy away from the situation. Accept it for this is happening. You're right to be annoyed, worried about it, but you know, we can get through this together rather than just pretend it's all fine, pretend it's all cool. That's going to probably cause more problems in the long run. But asking, but following on from that, we've had a question from somebody uh, from called, somebody uh, called Nick who's talking more about, I think he's got a quite a young baby um, he was saying that is it would it be how do you mitigate the impact on kids who are too young to sort of take on this like so he was talking about a six to 12 months old brain old brain development would that be affected by the fact that they're not seeing as many people as they normally are and they're not seeing the people that they might have otherwise been used to seeing and like is there any way you could give any advice on that for people who's like kids are a bit younger is there anything that we can do to kind of look after their brains i suppose yeah it's um it's a tricky one with the very young kids because they say like the, the from all the data i've read like the most formative age seems to be four years old which is my daughter's age brilliantly mm. enough and mm. it's like that uh, things happen then seem to have more of a lasting impact it's not that you know if you it's not like if you're four years old it's been bad happens that's it doomed for life it's not that mm. it's just at this particular point that's when this you know it's i think the analogy i use like when you're until that age your brain's sort of like packing the car when you're four years old it sets off and that's when sort of things have more long-term impact um i think yeah see it's it's it is annoying and distressing that you can't you know if you've got a young baby to you know, and let them see people and encounter them that tactile sense is going to be missed but if you can do more you know video conferencing let them see people's faces let them you know give them more contact yourself and it, it should be okay i mean this again like i say this is kind of unprecedented but i think kids are a lot more robust than people give them credit for like there's a lot of scare mongering like screen time like this is probably a very uh, good example like there's so much uh hysterical headlines going like oh kids on screen times it ruins their brains it doesn't the brain's a lot more robust it's a lot more especially when you're a child actually it's got a lot more um you know a lot more fail safes in place a lot more durability it's a lot more robust than people give it credit for because it's still developing and still it's, it does workarounds it's got all, a lot more plasticity so yeah if you can like do help them to encounter as many other people as possible via technology like this or zoom or whatever people are using but you know, and, but don't sort of be too stressed about it because when you're stressed that's something the kids will pick up on especially if you're their own you know if you're their primary contact now like exclusive contact i suppose anything that stresses you out more about them is going to have a sort of negative feedback loop 
and you know, try and sort of mitigate that. So also, again, look after yourself. That's probably the best thing you can do for a very young child right now. Like if you're the one who's constantly freaking out, constantly stressed, that's going to have a negative impact on them because they can pick up on that sort of thing. You know, they're not, they're not conscious enough to recognize words and things, but they, they, they recognize vibes, tones, you know, emotions. That's something they can pick up on. So if you can look after yourself more, that will hopefully have a sort of a calming effect on any young offspring or too young to know what's going on. Adam, Thanks, that's uh, really, really helpful. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. Adam, sorry, I just want to ask you about what, what are the things that we can do mm. or what, that might be useful for doctors and nurses in terms of, uh, I know you're talking to nurses last week that, that, you know, some of them, are, you know, trying to work out what they're going to do when they're going to have to go into ICU and the worries, and as you said as well, the kind of lack of, of, of some of the resources. What, what are the most practical things that we can do to help people within our health service? Well, well, A and A and one. The most important thing you can do is keep yourself healthy and keep yourself from in potentially infecting other people. That is absolutely the best thing that you can do for the NHS. The, you know, the, you know, the doubling effect, obviously, of of infection means that you going out when you don't need to and passing something unwittingly on to someone else can literally infect tens of thousands of people within a very short period of time. That's that's the single thing you can do. All the advice about staying home, washing your hands that that will keep you well. Um, and that and that will help the NHS um, be sensible how you access um, the NHS for any reason. Obviously, an emergency is still an emergency. And if you're going to have a heart attack or a stroke, your appendix is going to explode. You know, your, your body doesn't care that there's a pandemic going on. And the NHS is still definitely set up for all of that. Don't stay at home if you have something very serious that that still exists. But at the same time, if you've got an ingrown toenail or you're, you know, you're worried that you that you've got your, the floater that you had in your eye three years ago has come back. That, you know, be, be sensible. The NHS 111 website is a brilliant resource. You can do that. Don't go to your pharmacist. Don't go to your GP. Don't go to the hospital. They've got enough on. See what you can do remotely or by or by phone. That's, I mean, that on a basic level, that's a, that's probably the best thing you can do for the NHS. Don't put yourself at risk. Don't do DIY. Don't think, oh well, I'm here for I'm here for potentially a couple of months. Let's construct a conservatory. You know, that don't get up on a ladder and start trimming your, you know, doing topiary. You're just <laughs> going to hack your arm off. Don't don't do that. Um, in, and in terms of what you can do in terms of protective equipment, which I think is one of the biggest things at the moment, you can do two things. You can be noisy. The government seem to be quite reactive. So we've seen a lot with the economic measures they've done, like this, the self-employment stuff came in, I think, to a certain extent, because everyone was up in arms about it. And then they reacted probably, you know, certainly not enough for, for lots of people in the arts, but they've done something. But if you're noisy, if you're saying, why aren't these tests happening for healthcare workers that you said, why did you say two, 250,000 tests a day if, uh, you know, if you didn't, if didn't mean it, ask if there is all this PPE equipment, why isn't it getting to the front line? Why am I hearing from all these doctors and nurses saying, and and if I know money's tight for a lot of people, but there are fundraisers at the moment to get um, that protective equipment to the front line. It shouldn't be this way, but it is. And then there are, there are a couple run by doctors and former doctors which have the supply chains in place. It isn't an absolute lack of equipment. You know, there's there, there's one that I was supporting recently that's actually getting it at cost price to the people who... <laughs> Who, who need it. And it, it shouldn't be the case. And it should be the government, not, not people trying to chip in. But we are where we are. And every bit of equipment that gets to the front line will help a doctor keep you safe and keep themselves safe or a nurse or a pharmacist or a midwife or a paramedic. Thank you. The uh, also the, uh, another question from another Adam actually, which is uh, he wants to know: Do you think it would have been possible for us to be prepared for this? you can never have a health service that is constantly set up for this level of emergency that happens you know 
So, you know, it's the first time in our lifetimes, isn't it? That said, you can have a health service which has got some slack in it. So at the moment, we're short 100,000 members of staff in the NHS, 10,000 doctors, 40,000 nurses, a system that's that's always been stretched, has never been stretched tighter than it is at the moment. And, you know, doctors have been saying for years, we're not really set up anymore for a bad winter, for a nasty strain of flu. And, um, and this level of, of stressor um, with the, this coronavirus, you know, it would be better if if the NHS had a bit more slack in it. That's That's one thing. Another thing is, why don't we... You know, we to all accounts that have been, by all accounts that have been, to ask the question, you know, how well to ask the question, how well we set up, and we need to accept, and we need to accept the last pandemic. That this isn't the last pandemic of our lifetime, and we need to learn lessons. We need, probably need to have PPE um, stockpiled. We probably need to to know what our, our ventilator capacity is and what our ITU capacity is. Um, and we also need to learn from the countries who have managed much better to contain. So, um, for example, um, testing and, con and contact tracing involving technical solutions has really, has really, you know, sorted out quite a few countries. And we, we need to we need to learn that. And probably most importantly, before the next pandemic, there needs to be a huge we need to think hugely about public health, about keeping ourselves fit and healthy and well, so that as individuals, we're best placed, you know, to, you know, our, our bodies will thank us for not smoking and for cutting down the drinking and to, for moving around more and thinking about what we're putting in our faces. And because that will make us stronger and get us all better prepared. Thank it's you very much, Adam. to think that, most of the population is now going for 30 minutes of daily outdoor exercise like that is genuinely yes. something that i was I, I was thinking about it and i was like imagine if we as a country all continue to do it it's so like beautiful and useful it's um fun. i hope that doesn't and, sound um, too sad uh, we've uh, we bought a treadmill treadmill um Whoa. and uh and it turned up and the box came it was it wasn't a sort of fancy dancy super mega expensive one obviously but the, the box came and we were like there can't be a treadmill in here and it turns out it was in like 8000 bits yeah. like sort of stacks and stacks of nuts and bolts and that presumably is the thing that the 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 spinny round bit that you run on and so um we don't really have a we don't have a treadmill yet but at some point <laughs> getting a maybe treadmill we'll. together that I mean, feels like it that's going to see out more than one pandemic lockdown putting that <laughs> treadmill together <laughs> uh, just um, one more, your, your latest book is uh we you, you have so you have two books out at the moment don't you two three two new books. four four uh, four new four. books out <laughs> No, You've got two four new books, books four total. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I've got to, let's right. not overdo it, okay? This okay. is just frankly <laughs> rampant showing off. When You know that everyone out there is starting to write their book now, so don't start <laughs> showing off with your four books. Um, but uh, the latest one is looking at kind of uh, the, the relationship as children get a little bit older with their parents. That changes. And we had a question from Matthew, which is, how do you get teenage kids up when you're in lockdown? Um, um, <clears throat> well, obviously there are... Uh, brute force methods like you know sort of setting fire to things or you know <laughs> but it's you know it, it's that's the one thing i do tackle in that how important it is that they do get up and what what is the reason you want them to get up is it because you want to impose a sort of or sort of encourage a, a sort of a, a healthy daily routine because one thing that's often overlooked is that teenagers do genuinely need a lot more sleep and because of all the internal brain development going on at this time of life and all the internal hormonal shifts going on and they have a radically altered sleep cycle so something to do with like the melatonin increase and the desire for new experiences and stuff they like the average, average adult, because of the, the way sleep cycle works, they tend to get sleepy around 10-ish. And you know, that's when the internal brain starts closing down a bit. Uh, whereas for teens, it can be as late as midnight, 1 a.m. So telling a teenager to go to bed at 10 is all like telling an adult to go to bed at 6. Like you, you, they can do it, but they'll just lie there staying at the ceiling and being resentful. And because of all this stuff going on inside their heads and all the different changes, as well as the daily 
grind of what the brain's doing. They average you usually need like an hour's extra sleep, maybe two. So you know, they've done studies in America where um, school days have started later. So it started at 10 rather than nine and academic um, performance has gone up and people have been more calm and less stressful. And it's, it's all been quite nice because teens by and large don't get the sleep they need. And you know, especially now in lockdown, they, they can't do anything else. So they're stuck, they're stuck on their phones a lot more, stuck on their devices. It's not really vital that they do get up at the nor- normal time for like the adult working day. It's probably healthier now they got the chance to let them sleep and let them sleep for a bit longer. Because, I feel you know, finally yeah. vindicated in so many ways. I want to like record it and play it back to my yeah. mum and be like, see? Yeah, I have the exact same thing. My dad said, look, you're on student, student time again. He said, I am really tired, dad. Leave me alone. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> also, if they come downstairs in the morning, like, oh, look who decided to show up. Eh? Like, okay. Wait, wake up. A volley awesome. of abuse from your parents. What a lovely day to serve. Why are teens always so grumpy? And that's where they start asking then. So, yeah. So Also, as the parent of a toddler. parent of a toddler who has already factored in the extra hour and started reverting to <laughs> hours early waking up. And I'm like, how? It's only been two days. I'm like, if you're the parent of people who like to sleep in, please enjoy it on my <laughs> behalf. Enjoy Absolutely. it for me. <laughs> yeah, you're just a, uh, a series of, uh, of of pieces uh, uh, on Cosmic Shambles, aren't you? Your brain during lockdown. Mm-hmm. We do that soon, just like for stuff like yeah, stuff like this, because I, a lot of people have asked me to do do that, and um, no one's ever asked me to do videos before. So I thought, well, I'll take take advantage of that while um, while I can before people lose interest. But it'll, it'll be very soon. Right. Well, so <laughs> thank you for that. And, and, and Adam, can I just find? Uh, have, have you, apart from putting together your treadmill, uh, is there any have you, have have you created you... some kind of structure for your day or some kind of ambition while you go? Well, while I'm I'm, I'm trapped in this scenario, um, I'm trying um, I'm trying to use the time when I thought I'd be doing other things to be creative in any way I can. So I'm doing a lot more writing uh, than I would have otherwise been doing, and just basically keeping my brain uh, brain moving. In the absence of my legs moving. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for uh, and, and everyone go and find it. D- Dean's books and and Adam's books are, uh, they they have all been best sellers and they have all been very deserved bestsellers. Um, and uh, Adam, so, I want to say my sister loved your book and she got it for me as well. And she got it for me as well. It's very <laughs> exciting that it's like it's always really nice with me and my sister. <laughs> So it's a book that's been bringing people together as well. So yeah. what a lovely, positive end. And uh, as Josie mentioned as well, there's a tip jar at the bottom here. Uh, we're collecting money, which we're going to use, distribute amongst people who've kind of uh, pretty much hit the wall with the fact that uh, uh, work has, uh, has, has vanished for, for the next few months. And also, as Josie mentioned, some of the the, uh, the small local art centres, which aren't just about the gigs that go on in the evening. Very often they're a meeting place for people in small communities as well. So uh, they're going to be struggling and we're trying to make sure that we can get money for them. So thank you, Dean. Thank you, Adam. And uh, now we're going to go over to Grace, who's allowed to use her time any way she wants. If she wants to play a song, she can. She wants to show us. It's really up to you. Stop turning me into the patriarchy. <laughs> um, I'll sing you a song. <laughs> Apparently, it's, uh, it's on top of everything else. It's about to get quite cold. <laughs> um, because we are, we're not short of plagues. <laughs> So I thought I'd sing you a song that I wrote about um, the autumn. Uh, can you hear my dog barking? There's a, there's a, we had this with Miles Hunt a couple of days ago where it, every now and then he didn't realise he was still on microphone. Yeah, shut up. Shut up, Winky. Winky, shut up. And there's a beautiful thing. Anne Sexton, the the the, the poet Anne Sexton, there's a uh, sixties, um, starting to read her poem, Menstruation at 40. And just as she starts to read it, she goes, Will someone shut their damn dog up? And it's this great conflict between this this kind of very beautiful uh poem of contemplation and her telling a dog to shut up. So um, are we gonna meet your dog then? Or you well, just go- if I go and sit with him, you will stop barking, I think. You will stop barking, I think. Here we go. I like this reality. Isn't it good? This is Frank. I know Frank. Hello, Frank. Interrupting my work. This is my work. This is the only work we have, darling. This is what's getting (laughs) your... Um, So, yeah. I sing you a song about um, bad weather. It's called Cold Waterproof Jacket. And it is about being good to each other. Um, So, uh, which is something I think we all need to do at the moment. So, it goes like this. I 
to make a claim to any half decent band name. It's too much to hope there'd be any good tunes left. But I've been around and I've seen enough to know my strong suit isn't love. I won't give away my heart and call it theft. I won't give away my heart and call it theft. Well, I know you're locked up like a fortress I'd wait forever at your doors Even if they never open You don't need to be mine But I'll be yours But I'll be yours Yours I'll be yours Cold water, proof jacket Get me on when you just can't hack it Your last ticket, spare fibre I bring you up like a deep sea diver When you're breaking, you can't take it Get me out like a heart first aid kit Get me out, I'm your heart first aid kit Whoa, whoa Get me out, I'm your heart first aid kit Whoa, whoa Whoa, whoa Well I was born too late to make a claim To any half decent band name it's much to hope there'd be any good tunes left But I've been around and I've seen enough I know my strong suit isn't love I won't give away my heart and call it theft I won't give away my heart and call it theft Well I know you're locked up like a fortress I'd wait forever at your door even if they never open You don't need to be mine But I'll be yours But I'll be yours Yours I'll be your cold water Brief jacket Get me on when you just can't hack it Your last ticket Spare fibre I bring you up like a deep sea diver When you're breaking You can't take it Get me out like a heart first aid kit Get me out I'm your heart first aid kit Well, I know you're locked up like a fortress I'd wait forever at your doors Even if they never open You don't need to be mine, but I'll be yours And if you have a mind for feeling guilty Honey, I'm not keeping scores You don't have to promise nothing You don't need to be I'll be yours, yours I'll be your cold water, brief jacket Get me on when you just can't hack it Your last ticket, spare fibre I bring you up like a deep sea diver When you break it, you can't take it Get me out like a heart first aid kit Get me out like a heart first aid kit Get me out like a heart I'll be your AA card Last train home Pocket change when you need a payphone Whenever you need me You're overdraft and you can't exceed me When you break it, you can't take it Get me out like a heart first aid kit Get me out, I'm your heart first aid kit Get me out, I'm your heart first aid kit Get me out like a heart first aid kit Grace Petrie, and you can uh, find her work at her website, which is very easy to find. It's just gracepetrie.com, isn't it? It's worth following me on Twitter and Instagram if you're interested in folk versions of popular songs, which we are doing in alphabet as uh, one a day. Today is L. Oh yeah, you did one by five the other day, didn't you? The uh, the boy band five, didn't you? The uh, the boy band five was it that me? Yeah, 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 we did keep up music. So find all those things. Uh, just quickly mention tonight at uh, eight thirty. Mention tonight at uh, eight thirty. Uh, joined by Michael Leg, also Jacko, who is the uh, the lead singer and one of the guitarists of King Crimson uh, currently, and he's going to be talking about uh, well all of that work and a lot of other work he's done with Program with Al Murray as well, and hopefully with one uh, other guest. Are you available this evening, Grace? Because we could really do with a song if you are. Um, and uh, tomorrow, it's uh, genuinely are. If you, if you fancy do, doing, uh, 
<laughs> if you fancy it with Ben, that would be absolutely great. And uh, also tomorrow night, and uh, and tomorrow night at eight thirty, uh, and tomorrow night at eight thirty, Ed Gamble and James A. Castro doing their off the menu uh, podcast with Richard Herring on the Cosmic Shambles Festival as well. Thank you very oh, much. That would be really fun. Um, uh, I I think you probably can't see me, but Baba, do you want to say goodbye to everyone? Hi everyone. Yeah. Bye. Say goodbye to Grace and bye to Robin. Bye, bye Robin. Bye. <laughs> say goodbye bye. to Dean and bye to Adam. Bye, Abby. Yes, you did brilliantly. <laughs> you said goodbye to everyone. Well done. Mm.